All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> I hope you're all able to find some time for reflection this past Memorial Day weekend. I'm Lauren Speranza, the new director of SIPO's Transatlantic Defense and Security Program, coming to you from Washington, D.C. I'm thrilled to be joining SIPA at this important time for the transatlantic community, and I'm delighted to help kick off today's event, launching SIPA's latest major report, One Flank, One Threat, One Presence, a strategy for NATO's Eastern Flank. Before we jump in, I'd love to take a minute just to commend the report's authors, Lieutenant, retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, Janusz Bugajski, both of whom we'll meet here in a minute, retired Colonel Ray Wojciech, who's the director of SIPA's Warsaw office, and Karsten Schmiedel, who works in our transatlantic defense and security team here in DC. Hats off to you all for producing a top quality substance rich report. The report is actually the culmination of an 18 month effort, which was informed by many consultations and events. So let me also thank all of those listed in the report's acknowledgements who have been part of this process. You know, it's not so often that you see so many specific and concrete recommendations in a paper like this, and I really think it helps contribute and lead the debate on the Black Sea security piece in particular. There's a great deal of nuanced analysis in here that I look forward to diving into with all of you in a minute. And the report is officially live on our website at sepa.org, so I encourage all of you to check it out. Of course, NATO's eastern flank is something we've been hearing a lot about in the years following Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, which prompted NATO to go back to basics to bolster its defense and deterrence posture in the region. And since then, NATO has made tremendous strides to do so, including through the deployment of the Enhanced Forward Presence multinational battalions in the Baltic states and Poland, an increased capacity to bring reinforcements rapidly to the eastern flank, and a more robust NATO command structure capable of conducting high intensity multi-domain warfare with little warning. But as the report argues, much of these improvements have been asymmetric, prioritizing the Baltic Sea over the Black Sea region, which houses the much more limited tailored forward presence. And the report says this has produced a degree of incoherence in NATO strategy and left a concerning gap in Europe's southeastern flank that Russia is all too eager to exploit. And going forward, there's more to be done in both the northern and southern parts of NATO's eastern frontier to get the alliance where it needs to be and to meet the threats of today and tomorrow. Now, the report calls for an upgrade to the current tiered forward presence and outlines several concrete recommendations for enhancing NATO's eastern flank strategy. And just a couple, highlight a couple of them up front. The authors suggest everything from improving situational awareness and forging a more coherent threat analysis to reinforcing key allies like Poland and Romania, to bolstering key capabilities like integrated air and missile defense, nuclear and cyber, to developing a common operating picture for land, air and maritime, particularly in the Black Sea, conducting maritime policing operations in the Black Sea, improving mission command, personnel, planning and exercises, and of course, strengthening regional cooperation and partnerships. Now, to help us unpack the report strategy and some of these recommendations, I'm delighted to introduce my distinguished SEPA colleagues, two of the report's authors, who will serve as our speakers today. First, we have retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, who's SEPA's Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies, who's been leading the charge on the military mobility debate alongside a great deal of SEPA's regional security work. He most recently served as Commanding General of US Army Europe, and prior to that, as Commander of NATO's Allied Land Command. I'm also pleased to welcome Janusz Bugajski, SIPA Senior Fellow and host of the New Bugajski Hour television show, which is broadcast in the Balkans. Janusz has authored a remarkable 20 books on Europe, Russia, and transatlantic relations, and is a columnist for several media outlets on those issues. Thank you both for joining us, and congratulations again on the study. I'd like to come to each of you with a few opening questions just to help kick off our conversation and then leave plenty of time for Q&A from our audience, we really do want this to be an interactive session and a chance to engage directly with the author. So please, to all of you watching, we encourage you to join in. For those of you who are participating via Zoom, if you would like to pose a question to the panel, please use the Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom of your window. If you just click on that, it will allow you to type in your question and I'll receive them. And if you are tuning into the webcast on Twitter, please submit your questions at SIPA under the live stream tweet and they'll be sent to us here. So I'll open it up to all of you about the halfway point, but please feel free to start submitting your questions now so that we can collect as many as possible. And as a reminder, of course, today's discussion is on the record. And with that, 
Janusz, I'd like to come to you with the first question and I'll ask both of you just to limit your responses to two to three minutes each, uh, each time just so that we can get through a fair bit of substance. So Janusz, I think it would be helpful at the top if you could just outline for us you know, what the threat really looks like on the Eastern flank. I mean, is it really an issue of Russia rolling across borders and seas? Because I think there are some in the Alliance who you know, aren't really convinced of that and not everyone sees the Russia challenge in the same way. So help us understand why NATO should prioritize this given all the other competing demands that transatlantic countries are facing. Yeah, thank you, Lauren. Good morning and welcome uh, to everyone joining us today, whether good morning or good afternoon. Uh, well, let's put it this way. Our basic position in the report is to contrast NATO and Russia's strategy. NATO has significant differences in its capabilities along its eastern flank, as you outlined, uh, between the Black Sea region and the Baltic region. M more coherent in the, in, the, in the Baltic region, less coherent in the Black Sea region. Uh, in stark contrast, I would say Russia has, has a coherent position along its western flank. In other words, the flank that faces uh, not only NATO allies, but also NATO partners. And uh, behind this is, of course, Kremlin strategy. The Kremlin pursues a long-term strategy to try and restore Russia's regional predominance. Uh, even more than that, it's actually using the Black Sea zone, which we think is absolutely key to this whole region, uh, the Black Sea zone for force projection into nearby areas, including Central Europe, the Eastern Med, uh, the Caucasus, South Caucasus, the Middle East, and of course the Balkan Peninsula. All these regions, remember, surround the Black Sea, which makes it central in our calculations. Now, to answer your question very briefly, the main threats to NATO emanate from Putin's Russia, the main threats to NATO in Europe. And there are two kinds. I would say direct threats against Alliance members, and indirect threats to the alliance through attacks on NATO partners. And both of these threats involve a range of instruments, not just military, but they can also involve military action, and they can also lead to a miscalculation by Moscow and a potentially wider regional crisis. So in a way, the best way to prevent armed conflict is for NATO to demonstrate its awareness, its willpower, its coherence, and its capabilities, as we all specify in the report. Now, specific threats to NATO allies, NATO, uh, Russia probes the region with SNAP exercises. Uh, it's expanded the size and scope of its Zapad and Union Shield exercises, which target Poland and the Baltic states. It's building up its forces along NATO's borders, uh, particularly in uh, Kaliningrad and Crimea, uh, to expand and project its military uh, abilities. It stages frequent provocations against allied airspace and territorial waters. It endangers the free movement of commercial traffic, including shipping through the, through the uh, Black Sea. It also exploits other weaknesses along the flank in, in many areas, uh, ethnic, intergovernmental, cyber, domestic politics, corruption, disinformation. There's, there's a huge list that we can, we can provide here. Now, regarding threats to NATO partners, uh, Moscow, remember, already occupies Ukraine's Crimea and parts of the Donbass region about 12% of Moldovan territory in Transnistria, 20% of Georgian territory in Abkhazia and South Ossetia Skin Valley region. It's also destabilizing the Western Balkans. It's reinforcing its influences throughout the South Caucasus where it can manipulate different regional tensions. Uh, and it's also att attempting to drive a wedge between Turkey and the rest of the Alliance. So given all that, uh, given its ambitions, our report outlines both conflict scenarios but equally importantly, how to prevent those conflict scenarios from mushrooming into something much more dangerous. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. I'll just say that there's one scenario that we, I personally would like to develop more in the future. It's something I don't think our administration or any administration is looking at very closely. And that's the impact of uh, uh, unrest, potential unrest in Russia uh, itself, in the Russian Federation. Regional unrest driven by falling oil prices, and now falling gas prices uh, by the pandemic and the poor uh, reaction, the health threat in Russia, uh, the economic decline throughout the region it was already happening even before this, but it's, it's actually accelerated, I would say, the problems that Russia has internally. Russia could turn into a failing state uh, in the near future, but that itself isn't necessarily good news because it could also have a destabilizing impact uh, on several neighboring countries, including our eastern flank countries. 
I'll stop there and, you know, do follow-ups if you want. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Janusz. I think that's a pretty compelling case for why we need to pay attention to the eastern flank and for the threat there. Maybe just a quick 30-second follow-up. If, if there are a couple of ideas that you have, and there's a couple of recommendations toward this end in the report, but how do we start to get allies on the same page about this threat? You know, For those who see the threat differently, maybe have a different geographical position and are further afield and, and are more worried about threats that are closer to their own borders, you know, what do you say to those allies? How do we get everyone on the same page? Yeah, very briefly, I mean, one of the things we talk about is to get a very clear perspective and analysis of what the Kremlin objectives are. In other words, its objectives, its policies, its capabilities, almost on a daily basis. So we're not taken by surprise. So we're not taken, uh, so we're not, let's say, diverted into some other area when the Kremlin's uh, engaging in some operation in a particular part of the, the Eastern flank. I think that is very important in order to get everybody aboard to understand what is going on, to understand the threats to the Alliance. And, and of course, ultimately, I think it, it means also American leadership. Uh, and leadership does not mean dictation, but it means working closely in tandem with our allies in things like you know, prioritizing spending on specific weapons, on infrastructure, equipment, joint exercises, and so on, and working closely with the EU. I know you want to come to this a little bit later. We, we can say more about that uh, subsequently. Terrific, thank you so much. General Hodges, let me come to you. I mean, given what Janusz just outlined and described in terms of the threat environment, based on all your experience operating in Europe, what are the major capability gaps, maybe the top five in your view, you know, that you see on the Eastern flank and how should NATO address those? Lauren, uh, thank you. So five things. Uh, number one, absolutely uh, integrated air and missile defense. Uh, we don't have enough capacity. Uh, we don't exercise it enough. Uh, and you need land-based systems and sensors, shooters and sensors. You need air forces and, and air uh, platforms. And you need naval uh, platforms. We have the pieces, but there's not enough of it. And the only way you can be sure you've got truly integrated uh, multinational alliance air and missile defense is if you're exercising it throughout the year. And we haven't had an exercise on that scale, at least in the last seven years. And so this, this is my number one concern. And by the way, it has to, you have to have enough to last the duration of a potential conflict. Uh, most exercises were out of Patriot interceptors very early. So uh, it's capacity as well as capability. Number two, of course, it's uh, military mobility. Uh, mobility is all about uh, being able to move as fast or faster than a potential attacker than, than Russian Federation forces uh, in peacetime conditions to, uh, to convey to the Kremlin that that would be a terrible mistake if they thought that they could launch a short attack into Lithuania or Romania, for example, uh, before the Alliance could respond. And so this is about uh, not only the uh, border crossing uh, things that the EU really has to take the lead on fixing, but it's also about infrastructure, uh, rail capacity, um, heavy equipment transports. It's very difficult, for example, to get from Germany or Poland down into Romania because of the Carpathian Mountains. You know, how do we address that Pre combination of prepositioning, but also you have to be able to move quickly. Likewise, to move up to the Sawalki Corridor, You've got to get across northern Poland, which has more lakes than Minnesota. It, it is a, a challenge with lots of bodies of water, so you have to bring your own bridges as well. The third uh, critical gap is, um, I, would, I would call it command and control. Uh, there is no headquarters that is purely dedicated to the Black Sea region. Uh, no headquarters that's NATO uh, and joint that wakes up in the morning smelling Black Sea air. And that's that is really what we need in the Black Sea region is a three-star joint headquarters, uh, part of the uh, NATO uh, force structure, if you will. Uh, a good start would be an Intel fusion capability because what we wanna get to is what General McChrystal used to call the unblinking eye so that we know everything that's going on there in the Black Sea region. The fourth capability gap is in uh, overall naval capacity. Um, our great Navy uh, just does not have enough, uh, enough ships uh, to do all the things that's asked of it throughout the European and African uh, theater. Uh, so they're, they're constantly underway between the Black Sea 
the Barents Sea, the Mediterranean, they play a critical role for missile defense. It's just not enough. And Montreux, Montreux Convention is not the reason we're not competing well enough in the Black Sea. There's just not enough capacity. So that means we have to uh, make sure that all the allies are in. And Germany has done a good job offering this uh, Baltic Maritime Component Command in the Baltic Sea, where I think we actually have less of a strategic challenge there than we do in the Black Sea. In the Baltic Sea, uh, I think achieving sea control um, is very achievable within the first couple of days, given the geography of the Baltic Sea and, and the partners as well as allies and capability. In the Black Sea, it's different, different geography, different capacities. So maybe uh, we look to uh, increase reliance on unmanned maritime systems, particularly for nations that cannot afford uh, buying new ships or all the infrastructure required for that to complement what we do have. The fifth and final gap actually would drive the other four is the absence of a strategy for the greater Black Sea region. Uh, we've got uh, graduated response plans for the Baltic region, but we don't have fully developed and approved uh, plans for the Black Sea region. And I think if you put the Black Sea in the middle of the map, it changes how you think about the region. It changes how we think about Turkey's role, how we think about Ukraine. Uh, and it also then that would drive the ends, ways, and means discussion in a more fruitful way. Thank you so much. Really helpful overview. And I wanted to follow up on one thing just very quickly. You mentioned the, the unblinking eye and the need to see and understand what's going on in the region. I'm curious to hear, you know, if you have concerns about the U.S.'s recent decision to withdraw from the Open Skies Treaty, which of course allowed certain overflights that helped allies monitor some of the things going on in the region, Russian activities, troop movements, capabilities, particularly on the eastern flank. I mean, what might be some of the implications of this from your perspective? Well, uh, Russia is a gold medal winning legendary treaty violator. There, there's no doubt about that, that they have not lived up to their obligations uh, under the Open Skies Treaty or INF and, and numerous other agreements. So we should all be clear about that. Having said that, I think it's a mistake uh, for the United States to uh, announce that it's pulling out of the Open Skies Treaty. Uh, we are much more effective when we lead uh, and work with allies. Now, our European allies have known for years that the Russians have not lived up to it, but they actually have not in a meaningful, forceful way done anything. And so this uh, people being upset with the United States when we announce we're pulling out is uh, a little bit uh, late to the party. Having said that, uh, I believe the United States should lead, not leave, uh, and get our allies, uh, work with allies to put pressure on the Kremlin to cause them to live up. Uh, only the Kremlin benefits, frankly, uh, when we pull out of, uh, of treaties like this. Thanks, Ben. So, Janusz, I mean, I think we have a good idea of what the threat environment looks like. We know where the capability gaps are, but I think we'd be remiss if we didn't touch upon how the pandemic is going to affect all of this. And I'd be curious to see to hear how you see this playing out, both in a broader geopolitical sense. I mean, is this going to exacerbate divisions within Europe or perhaps between the US and Europe that Russia will seek to exploit? But then also from a resource perspective, I mean, how can we expect allies and partners to be prioritizing and delivering on these things as they balance their own domestic needs amidst shrinking GDPs and, and slashed defense budgets? Yeah, thanks very much. Realistically, if you look over the next year or so, uh, there will be a major economic uh, decline in, in all European economies as well as in the American economy. So there will be cause, I'm sure, in several Western capitals uh, for scaling down military budgets or diverting those military budgets elsewhere in the wake of the pandemic. In other words, the more focus on the southern flank. You know, there are projections that the, uh, the pandemic uh, as it is or, or a new wave of the pandemic could affect the poorer African and Middle Eastern countries in the future. And of course, that would convince a lot of people to uh, try and prevent refugee outflows, potential you know, violence and civil wars in these countries that could affect Southern Europe. So Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece, and these countries are going to be looking more, I think, towards the Southern flank than the Eastern flank. I mean, that's, you know, realistically speaking, I think that's going to be the case. But I think we have to convince uh, all our allies, all our NATO allies, that this is not a time to lower our defenses on the eastern flank. 
Why? Because Russia will exploit the pandemic to its advantage. A, a, a crisis for the West is an opportunity for Russia, let's put it that way. It will be viewed by the Kremlin uh, as an opportunity to weaken their adversaries. And if nationalism, as you say, uh, uh, increases in Europe, if, if it prevails over internationalist uh, solutions, if transatlanticism is weakened as a result, I think the Kremlin will have more inroads, more inroads to divide and rule, to try and get sanctions lifted, to play off uh, one European capital against another, to play off Europe against America. So, you know, in addition to one last fact, I think prolonged economic decline in Russia itself may also convince Putin that an external cause, an external attack uh, can help mute domestic unrest. It may not play out exactly as he expects, but nevertheless, he may be tempted to do that, as he did with Ukraine, uh, we saw in 2014, after he was fearful of public protests getting out of hand and potentially undermining his regime. So those two factors, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Janish. Ben, one thing I wanted to highlight in the report, you talk about the need to channel the spirit of cooperation among the Baltic states in Poland, but within the Black Sea region. And I think in reality, we're dealing with a much different set of actors in the Black Sea. You know, we have three NATO allies, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, two partners, Ukraine and Georgia, as well as Russia. There's much less dialogue, more competing interests. So it's harder to catalyze cooperation. And, and I think one of the biggest wild cards in the Black Sea region is Turkey which the report doesn't talk about in too much detail, um, but I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, how can we cooperate in this environment and work with Turkey despite concerns over its rapprochement with Russia, its purchase of S-400 air defense missile system from Russia, some of the political constraints and its own relationship within NATO right now. Be curious for your thoughts on that. So Turkey is a longtime ally since 1952. Uh, the framework of the of the agreement of the alliance with Turkey and the relationship between the United States and Turkey was was and frankly still is based on the Cold War. Um, when Turkey was at the bottom of the map, uh, it was all about containment of the Black Sea fleet coming out of the Black Sea, going through the Straits. Uh, that was the critical role that we expected of Turkey, as well as, by the way, being a host to nuclear weapons and, and uh, other capabilities. Um, that was what, that's what some people call Turkey USA 1.0. 1.0 is dead. It's, it's time for Turkey USA 2.0. I would not characterize Turkey's relationship with Russia as rapprochement. Um, certainly Turkey, and I don't defend any of the bad decisions that Turkey has made, specifically the S-400, you know, the U.S. government is exactly right to um, uh, push them out of the F-35, uh, but it's unfortunate. Uh, but I think also part of the problem is that uh, how we view Turkey and how Turkey thinks we view them, there's so much distrust. The fact that we have the boundary between U.S. European Command and U.S. Central Command is also the border between Turkey and Syria is a, is a symptom of that. Um, and so it call, I think that has resulted in us making bad decisions about giving weapons to YPG, for example, good tactically, but terrible strategically. And we're paying some of the price for that. So um, Turkey needs to be confident in the West that we will always be with them. Uh, and then I think we might see Turkey demonstrate more leadership in the Black Sea region. I mean, they're the obvious, they should be the lead NATO nation there. They're the dominant military power there. Um, I'd, I'd like to see them take more of a role, but all of their focus is to their South and frankly against their Greek ally as well, which is why we end up recommending doing so much with Romania uh, in the Black Sea region in the absence of, uh, of Turkey. Final point is that there definitely is a need for cooperation in the Black Sea region. Uh, the intelligence sharing between allies and partners, uh, the recent decision by Romania and Ukraine, for example, back at the Munich Security Conference to have an agreement on more intel sharing and more exercises is the foundation that, we should, that the rest of the region should be building on. Thank you. And maybe just one quick follow-up that you mentioned earlier a bit about the Montreal Convention as one of the factors that you must consider when you're talking about what NATO can and can't do in the Black Sea. Um, the Montreal Convention, of course, gives Turkey control over the Turkish Straits, regulates the transit of naval warships, 
Um, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on what to do with that. I mean, in the interim report that was released before the final here, you talk about the need to reform Montreux, but in the in the final report, you suggest leaving it as is. Um, so I wonder if you could just say a quick word uh, about your rationale behind that. Well, I would like to take credit for uh, changing my view on Montreux as a result of further research and, uh, and education and being smarter about it uh, versus waffling. Um, the, the Montreux Convention is inconvenient in some ways, but at the same time, having a strong Turkey that controls the Straits, has sovereignty over the Straits, is an, at the end of the day, that's an advantage for the Alliance. Um, the Kremlin has to move through the Straits to, uh, to do what it does in Syria, in Libya, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So having the potential to shut it down by a NATO ally is at the end of the day to our advantage. And there are discussions about, you know, a, a second Istanbul Canal, does that change? And you hear people talking about, can we get around Montreux? Montreux was not the problem, uh, it's capacity. And the Black Sea region is so far um, not in a high enough priority to divert naval capacity for the United States or other allies to the region from somewhere else. That's why I mentioned that uh, lack of naval capacity is one of the top five gaps that we have in the alliance uh, or that we've identified in our report. Now, there is one thing I would like to see done differently is that uh, Turkey to have a, uh, to be more transparent about what is actually moving through the Straits. Uh, we rely on uh, various unofficial sources to say, hey, the such and such a ship just passed through there. But I am confident that there are occasions where Russian submarines, for example, leave that are based in the Black Sea, go through the Straits, uh, ostensibly to go to somewhere else, to another port for maintenance, but yet they uh, off the shore in the Eastern Mediterranean, they're, they're launching missiles into Syria. That technically is a violation of, of mantra. So I would like to see Turkey be more transparent and, and highlight when Russia does violate. Thanks so much, Ben. That's really helpful. Um, I want to open it up to the audience here in a minute, and maybe we can do a double header here that answers one of my questions and also one that I see coming in um, from my friend Tamara uh, from, from Georgia. And I think a fitting question as it's Georgia National Day here. But, um, you know, this is not a Black Sea only conversation when we're talking about the Eastern flank. But I think one of the interesting things that you address in the report is the role of, of NATO partners. And, and Janusz, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. How can NATO support Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, and others in the wider region? And what can they bring to the table? Sure, sorry, sorry I had to unmute myself. Uh, yeah, very important question. We, we, we do cover uh, in quite detail through the report. We have some recommendations also, but through the report on the importance of NATO partners. They're partners through the Partnership for Peace program, but they've also developed very close military and economic and social and political relations with uh, the West. Um, they are part of the West. They are part of, uh, uh, let's say, their aspirations are in, in joining Western institutions. And I'd say particularly Ukraine and Georgia, who uh, continue to be under attack from Moscow, they're actually on the front lines of Putin's imperial escapades. Uh, not only militarily, but economically and institutionally, they are very important for us. They can provide, uh, we actually for them, we can provide more concrete prospects for NATO membership, just as we did with Montenegro and North Macedonia. Uh, despite Russia's attempts to prevent those two countries entering, uh, that made them even more determined to come under the NATO umbrella and to contribute to NATO. And I would say, even aside from the military muscle that Ukraine and Georgia can bring to the table, which they already have in support of various American and NATO missions overseas, uh, which we do outline in the report, I think their political and economic development, their commercial interconnections with the rest of Europe, uh, and even more fundamentally, I would say their commitment to statehood and national independence actually strengthens NATO's values and principles, and it weakens Russia's claims to their history, to their territory, and to their population. Uh, so the fact that they exist, that they want to be integral, independent states, part of NATO, and eventually part of the EU, I think we should help them in this process. Thanks, Janusz. All right, 
It is 1030. I would love to open it up to our, our audience for some Q&A. We already have a great list of questions coming in, um, but please continue to submit those through the Q&A function on Zoom and also under the live stream tweet on Twitter. Um, I want to start with one of the questions we have that came in here is from Jamie Shea, longtime NATO hand and, and at Friends of Europe now. He says, currently there is no money in the EU MFF fund budget for military mobility, whereas we were hoping for 6.5 billion euros. What impact will this have on mobility? And can NATO make up this gap through its own infrastructure programs? General Hodges, you've been a, a, the leading voice on many of this issue when it comes to mobility, so maybe you can offer some thoughts there. Well, it's great to hear, uh, see that Jamie Shea is uh, on the net. Uh, he knows more about NATO than uh, anybody I know. Um, well, obviously, it's disappointing that uh, in recent uh, budget projections for the uh, European Union, uh, that it went from six and a half billion euro specifically for military mobility down to zero. And uh, nobody can talk about uh, European autonomy, strategic autonomy, or European army if they can't come up with one single euro for, for mobility. So uh, I, th I think this is a serious question about credibility of uh, European commitment to uh, security and, and defense, certainly uh, on the EU side. And it's a little bit worrisome because most of the work, most of the things that have to be done to improve military mobility have to be done by the nations and by the European Union. So uh, I am optimistic that there are enough people uh, that care about this issue and, and realize that mobility, whether it's military mobility or crisis mobility, is about giving political leaders options uh, in a crisis or pre-crisis situation. This is not about making it easier for Americans to have exercises in Europe. This is about uh, European governments, uh, as well as the Alliance, moving around. Uh, the Alliance does not have money for building bridges or uh, that sort of thing. But I do think nations such as Germany, for example, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, could invest more money in DB Cargo, Deutsche Bahn Cargo, which is the principal rail carrier for heavy equipment. And then Germany should get credit towards its 2% when it does that. When a nation invests in infrastructure that has demonstrable dual use military value, I think that should count towards 2%. So that may be a way to continue investment and improving uh, mobility. Sorry. Thank you, General Hodges. Um, I have another question here from Danny Kenyon that Janusz, maybe you can speak to a little bit of this. It gets at some of the domestic uh, forces inside countries on the Eastern flank. He says, can the panelists address how well domestic security forces in NATO, NATO's Eastern members are addressing pro-Russian paramilitary elements and how well the domestic security elements negotiate legal restrictions to coordinate their efforts with their own military and other NATO members. So I think broadly, if, if you could speak to some of the what we call hybrid threats sometimes happening inside these countries and the Russian forces um, that we see in the Eastern flank, you know, how are we tackling that set of issues? You talked a little bit about kind of the political warfare and how that impacts, uh, that's a separate threat um, coming to NATO's Eastern flank. So maybe you could share a bit of your thoughts on that. Yeah, if I understand uh, correctly, how to deal with, uh, let's say, sub-military or paramilitary uh, subversion and potential territorial disruption in uh, particularly the Baltic states, Poland, and, and maybe even Romania. Um, well, I like, I remember the statement by the Estonian defense minister when he was asked what would happen if the so-called little green men, these guys without uniforms, suddenly appeared in Narva or in East, somewhere in Eastern Estonia, he said, I'd shoot them. Uh, in other words, they need to make preparations, and they are making preparations, not only at the military level, of course, and, and border defense, uh, but also uh, paramilitary forces, uh, territorial defense forces, uh, the sort of all people uh, informational network. If they see something uh, suspicious, some activities, some uh, reconnaissance or some um, you know, suspicious characters coming over the borders or operating near the borders to report to the local authorities. So immediately there's a response from the centers, immediate response from governments. 
Um, again, these, uh, these, these local territorial forces are developing in the region. I know, for instance, in Poland, the Riflemen's Association, which actually preceded the Polish army, if you go back to Polish in, before Polish independence in 1918, um, that, that's been resuscitated, a lot of volunteers. Again, uh, to integrate better with the, with the National Army, with the Standing Army, with the Ministry of Defense, I think that's very important. Similar process, I think, in Lithuania and, and other Baltic countries. So, I mean, there's a lot to say there, but there's a lot of preparations one can make. I haven't even mentioned the disinformation, the information of the media um, uh, dimension of all this as well. I mean, there's different ways in which you can combat Russian subversion, but I think these countries are probably better prepared than any. Thank you for that. I have another question here from Tanya Latici um, from, from the EU side. And, and she's saying, as the US's pivot to Asia has become more concrete, particularly during the Trump administration, some allies are already imagining contingency planning in case the US would progressively retreat its troops and support from the Eastern flank, supposedly to redirect them to an Asian theater. How likely is it that such a scenario would play out in the next 10 to 30 years? And what could allies do to make it attractive for the US to stay plugged into Europe? And I think that also gets at this broader question of you know, US commitment to European security. And, and maybe you could speak to that, General Hodges. So um, US commitment to Europe is very clear. Even during the uh, administration, uh, the, even during the current administration, everything that was promised under President Obama's administration back at the Warsaw summit has been delivered during the Trump administration. And uh, the actual number of US troops on boots on the ground that are permanently stationed has increased as well as more rotational forces. So I, the facts on the ground are that US is still committed, but the other facts that matter um, are that we don't have enough capacity. And if there is a, uh, um, a conflict with China in the next 10 years, and frankly, uh, I do believe that there is a real possibility of a kinetic conflict, uh, not a probability, but a possibility of a kinetic conflict with China inside 10 years, then uh, a lot of important air and maritime and intelligence capabilities are going to be redirected there. I think the land forces probably uh, would not be uh, drawn down, not significantly, but those other critical uh, Air Force, Navy, intelligence capabilities, uh, those will be drained away, which is why we need a strong European pillar. So it's it's not, is there something that Europe could do to make itself more attractive for the U.S. to say, okay, we'll stay with you guys. The fact is, we need uh, a strong alliance, a strong European pillar that can continue to deter Russia while the U.S. has to deal with a uh, potential threat from China. Look, our economy is directly tied to stability and security and prosperity in Europe. The North America EU relationship is the biggest in the world. Plus, uh, we know um, all, uh, despite things that are said or tweeted, we know we need allies. And uh, all of our best and most reliable allies come from Europe as well as Canada and Australia. Thanks, General Hodges. Another question related to that from Valeria Yagisman. Um, asking about uh, the future of Defender 2020 and to what extent will the exercise go forward and how Moscow might react to something like that and, and perhaps the, the 2021 version of the exercise too. So uh, first of all, for Defender 20, it's technically a still underway. Um, you know, Defender 20 was deployment of thousands of pieces of equipment and vehicles and troops from the US to Europe. Uh, and, and it was sort of the umbrella for dozens of other smaller exercises that are happening all over Central and Eastern Europe. And of course, uh, I think it's called Allied Spirit that's happening here uh, starting next week in Poland. We'll have several thousand American and Polish troops doing airborne operation, river crossing. So th these are very sophisticated, complex uh, operations uh, that are still going to get practiced, not on the scale that was originally envisioned, but, but nonetheless, it's still happening. The thing about exercises carried out by NATO and by Western allies is the transparency compared to a Russian exercise. Uh, we have journalists uh, involved, embedded all over the place. We do uh, endless announcements about what's gonna happen in the exercise. So there is no threat to anybody 
and you compare that to the total lack of transparency on any of the exercises that Janusz addressed earlier, such as Zapad or Kafkas or uh, those types of Russian exercises, which is why our allies on the eastern flank, are, it scares the hell out of them because uh, you don't know if one of these exercises is something more than an exercise. And if the Russians were serious about stability and security and lowering the temperature, they would have the same transparency as we do. Now, uh, but this exercise also is another demonstration of American commitment. Defender 20 does not get one single vote for any, for any candidate. Um, in, the, in an American election, yet we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do this, and we're already planning, I say we, the military is already planning the Defender 21 exercise, which next year will go into the Balkans uh, and the Black Sea region, uh, exercising the ports along NATO's southern flank, which I think is a, uh, also a very uh, important signal. Thank you. Another question here from Sven Svakov from ICDS um, wants to go back to the, the northern part of the eastern flank, you know, because we've been talking about Black Sea security, but he asks, do you consider Baltic and Polish security to be completed? And if no, what ought to be done on the northeastern flank? And I think there's some interesting recommendations in the report about how Poland plays such a unique role in the region as kind of a bridge from the Baltic states all the way down to Romania. And um, there's some recommendations for what Poland might do. So Janusz, maybe you could say a word about this and what Poland should do, how you view their role in the region and what the US can do to support it. And um, you know, the US has done quite a bit in Poland already. So if there is more to be done, what should that look like? Yeah, I think very briefly, uh, our first report actually uh, that we issued was on the Suwałki Corridor, uh, which the Russians consider a gap because it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a one small area between Kaliningrad and Belarus where they have um, either troops or influence and can move troops into very quickly. And the danger was, uh, is, and I think it remains until we fully strengthen, fully, fully capacitate that, uh, that region, is that the Suwałki corridor itself could be a choke point that the Russians could cut off if we, in the event that they attack, let's say Estonia or, or Latvia or Lithuania, and we cannot reinforce, at least with ground troops, uh, into, into, through the corridor into, into the region. And this is why I think Poland can, does play a major role in reinforcing the, that corridor to make it as efficient as possible, as well protected as possible uh, for missile defense cover, air cover, whatever it takes to make sure that our troops can move into the Baltic states in the event of an emergency. Um, there's a lot of other things that we mentioned. Poland is doing a lot, not only in terms of its military spending, uh, but in terms of hosting different uh, NATO contingents, headquarters, uh, contributions to, to uh, various NATO missions, participation and exercises. There's a lot of joint activities between Poland and neighboring uh, forces, particularly with Lithuania, with Ukraine and so forth. And I think these can be developed, but this is all specified in our report. I'm sure Ben will have a few more things to say on that. Thank you. Um, in the interest of time, maybe we'll just try to get through a couple of more questions here. Um, I've got another one on the nuclear issue from Paul McCleary. Um, he asked about how do you see the end of the INF treaty, of course, the Interme Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and the impending US drop withdrawal from open skies, which of course we talked about open skies a little bit already, but kind of in the broader nuclear context, and General Hodges, maybe you can speak to whether you know, you have concern over, of course, post INF, but then also looking at the possible expiration of the new START treaty in 2021. You know, do you have concerns about NATO's nuclear and strategic capabilities? And, um, you know, how is this going to impact the alliance? So NATO is a nuclear alliance. Uh, and the reason we're a nuclear alliance is because potential adversaries have nuclear weapons. NATO has always wanted to uh, uh, avoid or, or to get rid of nuclear weapons, but as long as adversaries have them, and we have to have them, and you know the whole theory of deterrence is you have to have nuclear weapons so that you don't have to use them. Um, and the the arms control protocols and agreements that have evolved over the past several decades, uh, we were able to achieve those because. Uh, NATO, uh, with several of its members having nuclear weapons, as well as several of its members being part of the nuclear sharing agreement, such as 
Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium, and Turkey uh, were a, a symbol of the cohesion of the alliance, so that the Kremlin could not split off uh, certain you know, European countries from the United States. And the, and the INF Treaty was designed specifically to prevent that sort of splitting off. Uh, what has happened, of course, is that, as I said at the beginning, Russia is a world-class uh, treaty violator. Um, they have been in open violation for several years, and our European allies knew about it uh, as well. And while the, we've all complained about it, uh, it would have been helpful, uh, and it would be helpful in the future if all of our allies were as loud and clear about insisting that Russia live up to its obligations as they are in complaining about when the United States considers pulling out of a, of a treaty or an arrangement. Uh, now, the, the new thing, of course, is China. Uh, and I think it's reasonable to expect, whether we're talking about uh, INF or New START, that China has to be taken into account. And I think it's actually in Russia's benefit, to the benefit of the Kremlin, if they were as interested in getting an agreement and bringing China into it, uh, because Russia cannot cannot compete. I mean, they can't do this forever. So it's in, it's in their interest that uh, China also uh, come into it. And, and uh, I, I hope that they will uh, uh, play a, a leading role in this. Having said all that, I still prefer that the United States works within existing agreements and holds people accountable and brings along allies versus uh, walking away. I, I, I say again, lead, don't leave. Thank you. Just to stay with the China thread for a minute, um, we've got a question um, from the audience here about the increasing Chinese role, especially via the Belt and Road Initiative um, and some of the diplomatic moves uh, in the Eastern flank. And, and it, he's asking about NATO's response and what that should look like. Um, I think something that's interesting, of course, is, is Chinese possible manipulation of critical infrastructure in, um, in the region, in Europe, uh, but I wonder if maybe something that we could do as as NATO um, and as Europe, Europe and the United States together relates to the Three Seas Initiative and and the investment fund that goes along with it as a way to invest and develop critical infrastructure. And and I wonder if if you might have thoughts on whether that could play a role in countering something like BRI and and. Janusz, maybe you can speak to how the EU comes into that conversation there um, in terms of developing and investing in infrastructure. But um, Janusz, maybe you have some thoughts first and then General Hodges, I'll come to you. Sure, that's a big question about growing Chinese influence uh, across the BRI Belt and Road Initiative. It also involves this 17 plus one uh, European initiative with our region, specifically with Central Eastern Europe and the Balkan states. Um, which is a danger. Um, in other words, Russia, whereas Russia has territorial ambitions, uh, China has economic ambitions, which then it can transform and leverage into diplomatic and political gains. Uh, it's obviously trying to weaken the American role. It sees itself as a long-term competitor with the United States. And I think it's good to put in context, Russia ultimately is a declining power over the next decade or so, and it may decline much more quickly than we imagined. China is still a rising power, and regardless of the impact of the pandemic, I think that will continue uh, until there's uh, severe unrest in China itself and a potential threat to the rule of the Communist Party. Uh, not in all areas can NATO be active, of course. I mean, militarily, of course, NATO, to answer your question, NATO uh, can help by bringing all these countries into the alliance, working together with the EU. I think you need to wean these countries away from a Chinese investment, which is, as I said, geared towards political manipulation, this, this, this debt diplomacy that the Chinese engage in across the region. But that's going to involve uh, more resources, more investments from the European Union. There's only so much that NATO and the United States can do. I think the European Union here needs to play a much bigger role, particularly in the, Baltic, in the, in, in the Balkan states. You know, they, those states such as Serbia and uh, and Kosovo and Albania and Macedonia, they're very much vulnerable to Chinese influence. This is where I think the EU can be much more active, and give them more hope of not just entry, but also all these funds, adhesion funds and accession funds, all these uh, uh, ways in which these countries can be more closely bound to, to the Western uh, community. 
Thanks. Senator Hodges, do you want to come in there for a quick thought? Yeah. Look, this is all about great power competition, and, and great power competition prevents great power conflict. Uh, if we're competing in the diplomatic space, in the information space, and in the economic space, as well as in the military space, we have a much better chance of keeping uh, China uh, at arm's length, uh, as well as deterring Russia. Um, the uh, Port of Anaclia is a great example. If, if the Port of Anaclia in Georgia was ever done, uh, built uh, with a deep water port, it becomes the portal between Eurasia and Europe. Uh, and now uh, traffic moves across the Black Sea, European countries start getting interested in the stability and security of Georgia. And uh, they start putting money there and they, and they pay attention to Russia messing with the borders of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, for example. Um, Serbia, uh, if we, if the West, competes there and, and does things economically and in the diplomatic space that gives some hope for young people in Serbia and Kosovo and other Balkan countries that there is a future with the West, then I think we, we can move past the old hardliners in both countries that, that are still clinging to or responding to Kremlin or Chinese uh, inducements. So it's, it's competition in all the spheres gives us the best chance to prevent a conflict. Thank you. And I'll ask one final question here, as I know we have to wrap up soon. Um, but from, from Franz Stefan Gadi, asking about future high intensity conflict uh, between NATO and Russia and on the Eastern flank, to what degree could cyber capabilities replace kinetic capabilities? And if you have any examples of that, and, and I think it's helpful just to hear your thoughts broadly on how we're doing on those technology needs on the Eastern flank and, and how we're doing on developing things like cyber. General Hodges, maybe you have some thoughts before you jump off. So, uh, two or three points. First of all, cyber is critical for protecting our transportation infrastructure in Europe. I mean, without host nation support, we could have 8 million American tanks, uh, but if they can't move across Europe, uh, or as well as other allied uh, capabilities, if they can't use the airports, the seaports, the rail, uh, power generation, then it doesn't matter. And so the, the cyber vulnerability of uh, transportation infrastructure is, a, is something that has to be addressed. Uh, Lithuania and Latvia both have done a great job doing this and both of them count that towards their 2%, by the way, it, which is another thing that I think nations could and should be uh, encouraged to do. Uh, a second aspect of cyber, uh, as my friend uh, Frank Rose, uh, expert on uh, air and missile defense, uh, talks about getting left of launch. There are things that can be done to prevent uh, an enemy's uh, missile from ever getting off the launch pad. And that's gonna be uh, something that disrupts the capability of, of the missile. Uh, I think there's plenty of good opportunity for cyber in an offensive uh, role as well. And the Alliance knows this, the Alliance has addressed this. Uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg several months ago talked about a cyber strike uh, could be considered a, a violation, an Article Five situation. Um, so the Alliance is, is gripping this, but obviously we have a long way to go. Thanks, Senator Hodges. Janusz, before we wrap up, I just wanted to give you a chance to give any final comments. Um, overall, wrapping up things we didn't get to, things you think we should, we should have highlighted from the report. Anything else from your side? I think most things we've uh, we've mentioned. I just jotted down a couple of notes. Uh, uh, Defender 20, 2020 was mentioned. I think we should be looking now to Defender twenty twenty one, which uh, on on the on on the, the scale of expectations, I think it's going to be bigger. I mean, assuming we, we're not in the middle of another pandemic wave. Uh, but I would suggest that some of the um, conflict scenarios that we outline in our report could be very useful for NATO in devising uh, sort of exercises and tactical responses to potential uh, Russian incursions or proxy incursions. Uh, in other words, to deter and defend against some of these scenarios, particularly in the Black Sea Balkan region. Uh, and they could involve both uh, maritime and land components. Um, you know, one of the scenarios, for instance, that we, that we discuss is how Russia may try and ensnare Ukraine, Romania, Moldova into a conflict against each other, how to prevent this. Uh, you know, the military working together with our political leadership, um, working with uh, cyber capabilities, informational uh, 
uh, warfare and so forth. So this would be my suggestion for, for you know, looking ahead, looking for 2021. The very last point I would say is that uh, we, we must remember NATO and the EU are not competing organizations. And you know, I keep hearing this from people. The majority of EU states are also NATO members and the majority of NATO states are EU members. It's to EU's benefit to have a strong NATO because that ensures its security, not to compete, but to complement, to supplement the PESCO initiative, which I don't think has been mentioned, I think could be very important, uh, not just in, uh, in, let's say, helping bilateral ties between different militaries, but also for NATO purposes, NATO contingencies. And you did mention, of course, the, uh, the Three Seas Initiative, which at the moment I think involves about 12 countries to improve sort of commercial transportation, communications, linkages from the Baltic to the Black Sea and the Adriatic. Maybe one day also the Caspian, I think should also include the Aegean and the Eastern Med. I mean, that is a valuable opportunity where Europe, I know Germany has now made a, a substantial investment, where the US has made an investment. You know, this could well be the future for uh, helping to draw these countries together you know, strengthen numbers, strengthen communications, um, and enhancing NATO presence. Uh, and of course, that helps American security. This is another fact that thing that we haven't really talked about. NATO security means American security. The two cannot be disengaged. Such an important point to end on, and I think a great capstone to our conversation. Um, I know we have reached the end of our time, uh, but let me thank our terrific speakers for the superb discussion. We covered a lot of ground there, got through a lot of good questions. Thank you to our audience for your active participation and for sharing your, your comments and thoughts along the way. Thank you to my terrific SEPA colleagues, Christina Brown, as well as Karsten Schmiedel, one of the report's authors who helped organize today's event. And going forward, I encourage you all to look out for more from us coming soon. We've got a great lineup of work coming up, including another public discussion specifically on military mobility on June 2nd, as well as a Black Sea security discussion on June 4th. So please look out for those invitations. We hope you can join us for that. In the meantime, we encourage you to, to read in more depth today's report on our website. And with that, thank you all again and wishing everyone a very safe and healthy week.